Welcome, I'm Jeremiah Reiner, and this is the Deeply Rooted Podcast. Hey there, welcome to the Deeply Rooted Podcast. Thank you guys for tuning in again. Got some neat stuff lined up for you over the next few episodes, but we want to run down a few announcements very quickly. Don't forget, head on over to the Deeply Rooted Conference website. That's deeplyrootedconference.org. Blog posts, archived episodes that'll take you to our YouTube channel. And most importantly, our Deeply Rooted Conference is coming up this November. That'll be 8th and 9th, November 8th and 9th this year in Kingsport, Tennessee. We're going to be looking at the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Got lots of great speakers lined up for you, including, Lord willing, Justin Peters and Tim Challies, hopefully coming in uh, to help us tackle that topic. But if you want to, go ahead and find those tickets. If you go to the website, go up there to the top right-hand corner. There'll be a little drop-down menu, and that'll take you where you need to go to get those tickets. Don't forget, early bird rates right now, those will go up at the end of June. So go ahead and try to grab those tickets before they go up. Looking forward to that conference again. This will be our third one. Really excited about that. Doctrine of the Holy Spirit, November 8th and 9th. Again, Kingsport, Tennessee for the Deeply Rooted Conference. Speaking of Deeply Rooted Conference, we've got another Deeply Rooted Equipped coming up. That's going to be on May 11th. That will be held down in Sir Garnsville, Tennessee at Bass Chapel Baptist Church. There with our good friends Dave Rossetti and Justin Bice. We're going to be bringing in Brother Blaine Powell to be speaking that day on confessions of the church, and he's going to be kicking that off around 2 p.m. So deeply rooted, equipped, 2 o'clock, Sir Garnsville, Tennessee, Bass Chapel Baptist Church, again, May 11th, coming up around the corner. Now, having said that, a little bit different here coming up over the next few episodes, we have been working through at our home church of Calvary Bible Church, the book of James on Sunday mornings. We've just been going verse by verse expositionally there and uh, come up on a a really neat little set of sermons there recently. We're looking at chapters 2 and 3, and we kicked it off looking at faith and works. Then secondly, we looked at faith and words, and then finally, faith and wisdom. So we're going to be uh, airing all three of those for you and had the good privilege of preaching those sermons, and we hope that this is a help to you. We hope it's a blessing and an encouragement to the saints out there. So this first one is going to be looking at faith and works out of James chapter 2. James chapter 2, beginning in verse 14, James writes, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and as one of you say to them, go in peace and be warm and filled, without giving them this thing needed for the body, what good is that? So also, also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we ask favor of our time together. Faith and works. Father, we love you and come to you this morning to your word, very humbly reminded that this is your text. This is written from before the foundations of the earth. It's been true then, it's true now, it'll always be true. And so as we come to this this morning, and what may seem like some foggy scriptures, Lord, I pray that you give us wisdom here today. I pray that you would bring clarity to this text as it is. And I pray that you would use it to the means that you might save people. That someone would hear the truth of the gospel through this, and that you would resurrect them to new life in Christ. I pray that you favor our time together here today, that we're not in vain, that what we preach is in accordance to Jesus Christ, our Savior. And we ask these things this morning in his name. Amen. We just sang, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. I specifically picked that out this morning because the man that wrote that comes to mind very heavily in this passage. His name is Martin Luther. Martin Luther, famed German reformer, once wrote in the preface of his New Testament commentaries, that this Bible book of James was, quote, an epistle of straw. He wrote that as a young man, immature. He needed some help. God gave him some help, ironically, through the book of James, because by 1537, years later, that statement had been removed from all the prefaces and all the editions of his German Bible. They just simply would not have it 
And in fact, Luther preached himself five times from the book of James after that early negative statement about that book back in 1519. And the question remains, what changed Martin Luther's mind? Why was he so low on the book of James and all of a sudden he realizes this is absolutely canon. This is the word of God from on high for all of God's people. Here's a statement by Luther. He says, though this epistle of St. James was rejected by the ancients, I praise it and consider it a good book because it sets up no doctrines of men but vigorously promulgates or promotes, it proclaims the law of God. In other words, Martin Luther says this, it cuts it straight. James tells it exactly like it is, and it doesn't contradict any other version of Scripture. No passage, no book, no author, nothing of this contradicts anything in Scripture. And we certainly agree with Luther, but if you look at this text and you read through it, I think an easy 30,000 foot view, you might ask yourself, some of that tends to go against some things that we have held pretty tightly to. I mean, if you didn't know any better, you'd sit there and think, well, maybe James is promoting a works-based salvation. And then here we've got Paul and other New Testament writers saying that we're justified by grace through faith alone. And after all, nobody taught saving grace alone other than Jesus Christ. So you read James and you think, man, is he deviating here a little bit? Is he getting a little off course from what we would read through other parts of the text? Romans 1 verse 17 comes to mind because if you read James 2 and then you go back here Paul wrote for in this righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith as it is written the righteous or the just shall live by faith period by the way no more after that they'll live by faith as a matter of fact that statement is what convicted Martin Luther so strongly that hey here I am in this workspace system of Roman Catholicism, and he's reading the just shall live by faith, nothing else. And so we read James and we think, is there tension here? I'll go back and I'll read to you very quickly Romans chapter 4 because Paul hammering home on these things, and many again easily could read this and think, my goodness, I think we've got a problem here. Verse 1, Romans 4, and what then shall we say? It was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh. For Abraham was justified by works. He has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God. You can read that in Genesis 15. And it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in Him who has justified the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. For as David also speaks of the blessings of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from words. Now friend, I could easily see somebody reading those two passages and think, I need some help here. I mean, we've got to reconcile two texts. And the answer to that would be, no, you don't. (laughs) No, you don't. God is not divided, friend. God is not divided. The Word of God is laser sharp focused in one direction, and that is this. Grace alone, by faith alone, through Christ alone. Period. Praise His holy name. We're going to look at that this morning as we reveal this. Because it also says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, Paul wrestling again. We are, excuse me, for by grace you're saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. So does this mean that James is saying somehow we are justified by works and Paul is saying somehow we're justified by faith? No. Not at all. Please do not walk out of here thinking that this morning. There's no contradiction between being saved by grace through faith and faith that is without works is dead. Those are absolutely two sides of the same coin. We are not talking different currency here when it comes to heaven. To put it another way, Paul's talking about means of salvation. James is talking about marks of salvation. And they're both right. So as some have said before, we're saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves us is never alone. Let's look at that this morning as Christian believers, not because we're doing this to be saved, but because we're doing this because we are saved. 
So let's get that correct here in looking at real living faith in Jesus Christ alone. Number one, faith without works is false. And that's the Bible. Faith without works is false. Look at verse 14. James says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? How are you going to tell me you're a Christian and literally live opposed to Jesus Christ? Now, friend, I'm sorry. That'd be like me looking at you and saying, I've got blonde hair. You ought to laugh at me. Because it's foolishness. It's a lie. I'm saying one and I'm living another. That's not true. You can't look at me and say, I love the Lord Jesus Christ, but I hate everything about Jesus Christ. It doesn't work like that. I love Jesus, but I want to disobey Jesus. Love Jesus, hate His bride though. Love Jesus, hate the Bible. Those two things are not compatible. James is giving you a very simple explanation here. Folks, you can't say you have faith in Jesus and literally don't live for Jesus. That's impossible to do. So what we're seeing in here is a false profession is what he's occurring in. He says don't be duped into false conversions here. Notice the Bible says what? Can that faith save him? That's very important that you see that. Some translations leave out the word that. That is crucial that they do not do that. The the correct translation in that, and he asked the question at the end of verse 14, can that faith save him? In other words, can you have a faith that doesn't do anything for the Lord Jesus Christ? Is that going to cut it? You'll stand before God one day and say, Lord, I love you, but I don't do anything that you have. Didn't live according to your word, didn't feel like it, didn't want to do it, wasn't a part of any of that. No. That faith cannot save. It's a shallow, empty, false set of words. And listen, folks, just because somebody says something, that don't mean it's true. I mean, good gracious almighty, we live in a world of lies. You can't just believe everything that comes out of somebody's mouth. I mean, I'm sitting in a room full of people right now. Let's just all be honest. We've all lied either to somebody else or to yourself. And many times I've looked in the mirror and been like, that looks pretty good. My wife said, no, it doesn't. <laughs> You're colorblind and none of that matches. And I'd say, well, praise God. <laughs> I'd lie to myself sometimes, much less other people. So yes, you can't just take something at their word. Simply repeating religious phrases, that's never saved anybody. Sadly, we live in a generation where salvation is handed out on every corner in America. It's called easy believism. And I'm here to tell you, friend, it is running rampant in this country. It's one, two, three, repeat after me, sign this card. Here's a T-shirt with our logo. Let's take your picture so we can post it on our social media this afternoon and tell all the other churches that we're competing with in the area that we outdid them on professions of faith today. That sounds a little too close to home, doesn't it? You know why? Because it's happening. It's happening. Hey, look, 20 people came to the front this morning. They said something that somebody told them to say. Gave them a t-shirt. Hallelujah. Look at them now. We're going to baptize them this afternoon. You have to be very careful, friend. Just because somebody says something does not mean they are actually something. The sinner's prayer is what we often refer to it as. Let me ask you something very seriously. You don't have to answer this out loud because you know the answer. Can you find that in the Bible? What got quiet, didn't it? You don't have chapter or verse for that anywhere in the 66 books that God has handed you. You don't have one example of one person in all the history of the world coming to saving faith because they repeated something called a sinner's prayer. I'll tell you what does save people. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ saved. You know why? Because He's Savior. That's who He is. That's the name we ascribe to Jesus because He's the only one that can do that. Repeating just a bunch of pious phrases doesn't save anybody because it's not real faith. You can have all the religious vocabulary you want to in the world If you have not encountered divine God, friend, you're not saved. There has to be a work of the living God in you, bringing you from death to life spiritually. Well, I went up forward and I said a few things. That's all well and good. Did Jesus Christ transform you though? 
Did Jesus transform? That's the only question that needs to be asked. James is saying this. If that's all you got, notice, what good is that? I mean, he literally asked, what good is that kind of faith if that's all you've got? It's good enough to fool you into a false conversion. That's what it is. And here's the scary part. And I like the fact that Luther mentions it so much in that hymn of A Mighty Fortress. He talks often about the enemy in that hymn, doesn't he? Because that's a tactic that the father of lies uses. He will dupe you into believing everything's okay when it is not. Jesus Himself said, there will be many that stand in the day of judgment and say, Lord, Lord, did we not do and say and this and that? And what does He say to them? Depart from Me. I never knew you. Why would He say that? Because they never knew Him. That's why. False converts. Secondly, faith without works is fruitless. Look at verse 15. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one says to them, go in peace and be warmed and filled without giving them the things they need for the body, what good is that? What good is a pat on the back and you're in need? It's not going to help anybody. So also, faith by itself does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, we have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. Verse 19, you believe that God is one. And you do well. That's true, by the way. That's good. It's not wrong. Amen. I mean, it's in accordance with Scripture. You believe that. That's great. Friend, I used to believe the Bible too before I was saved. I just trusted all the Sunday school stories were right. I mean, sure, Jonah and Abraham and Moses and Joseph and Peter, James, and Paul. And I mean, yeah, praise the Lord. Great. Awesome. Are you saved? You know? Seems okay to me, though. See, that's the problem. It's just intellectual agreement. Notice what he says. Even the demons believe. Friend, that ought to lay us all out in our faith. Uh, Whoa! You're telling me that supernatural enemies of God have more faith than I do? Sadly, maybe. Maybe. Because they do not doubt Jesus Christ. I can tell you that. Notice what it says. They believe and they shudder. That means tremble. That means literally almost like spine thing. It means literally like almost stand them up. Like hair on your head when you hear something that's so amazing it almost scares you. That's the term there it is using. They believe Jesus and it drives them to amazing fear. Faith without works is fruitless. I want you to think about this. The same devil and his demons are right now possessing more faith than many professing Christians. Because they believe Him. You know why I know that? Think about this. Because they possess an intellectual faith. You would believe how many professing Christians I meet that say, well, I mean, I, yeah, I follow Jesus. There ain't no way all that Bible's true. I mean, come on. So you're calling Him a liar. You say, well, that's not what I said. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Because the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. You're doubting Him. That means the enemy has more faith in Him than you do. Ah, he didn't really turn water to wine. The devil believes that he did. Ah, I mean, did he really get buried and three days later and rest? The devil believes he did. See, friend, we, we really stop sometimes on some things that sadly the enemy of this God that we serve is actually believing in and we walk away from it. I used to remember watching a show when I was a kid on reruns, Dragnet. I remember Joe Friday. <laughs> I say this to my students sometimes. They'll get on some spill. Well, I would have turned it in. And, we, you know, this and him hauling around. And I just say, listen here, just the facts. Well, Joe, he just looked at me. I had somebody go on this big diatribe. Well, what happened was, and they get all emotional. And he just cuts them off. Just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts. See, that's the problem with the devil. It's always God. He's Joe Friday. He's just got information. He doesn't possess faith. That's the difference, by the way, in heaven and hell. It's faith in Jesus Christ. A lot of people in hell, friend, that know Jesus is right. They've just never put their faith and trust in Him. That's the problem. See, the demons recognize who Jesus is and they are going to refuse to submit to Him. Because think about this. 
They believe that He's the Son of God. You can read that in the Bible. They acknowledge it. Satan acknowledges that he was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, performed miracles, died on a cross, was buried in a borrowed tomb, resurrected on a third day, and ascended into heaven. Do you know they believe all that? That's the truth. And that's why they fight against it. Because they know it's real. But remember, no faith though. See, they're not trusting Him for salvation. Here's the problem. When they hear the name of Jesus, they shudder with fear because here's something to think about. Real faith doesn't cause fear. It causes fruit. (coughs) It causes fruit. It brings peace. And what is peace, by the way? But a fruit of what? The Spirit of the living God. You don't produce that unless it's living in you. When you think of the Lord Jesus Christ, it ought to bring peace. Everything's going to be all right. He's won. He's won. It's over. We're victorious. I don't think about Jesus and think, oh my goodness, I wonder what He thinks about. No, I've got assurance, friend. Because He said, I'm His and He's mine. Because it's all resting on Him. I trust that. Romans 5 verse 1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, What's your work? We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what one of the great works of Christians is? They just trust the Lord. They just trust the Lord. Oh, it's bad out there right now. I'm just trusting Jesus. That's fine. I'm just going to sit here and be at peace. Well, it's falling apart. Not in heaven, it ain't. Not in heaven. Well, I don't know what we're going to do. He does. It'll all be all right. See, that's the work of faith. It just brings this great peace and calm that you're thinking, man, He really does have it all together, doesn't He? He really does have it all together. This real faith in Jesus, think about this, it naturally results in fruit, folks. This isn't something I've got to try to drum up in and of myself. The spirit life is one that results in natural fruit. Notice, whereas the intellectual dead faith only results in fear, And it's suppressed and then it's converted, think about this, into prideful self-righteousness. See, I'll do it myself. Well, I better go to church more. I better do this more. I better read that more. I better abstain from this and abstain from that. And it turns into this do, 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 do. James says that's not faith. Faith is just simply trusting. You say, well, Jeremiah, what about the thief on the cross though? I mean, there's a man that he he professes Jesus. Where's his work of faith, though? I mean, how can you say that that man's going to heaven? Because Jesus said so, that's why. And friend, it ain't hard to find his work of faith because y'all are sitting here thinking works of faith evangelism and going out and doing this in some big public. Friend, that's not all works of faith. Sometimes my best work of faith is when I just keep my mouth shut when I could have opened it. You see, a lot of people didn't see that. God did. It's called self-control, and it's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. I'll give you one from this thief on the cross, though. He trusted Jesus Christ alone, and that faith produced fruit, didn't it? You know how I know that? Because he began to evangelize. The Bible tells me that he looked at the other man on the other side of Jesus, and he told him the truth. You and me, sinners, pal. That guy right there, priceless. The living Son of God. He has done, as He said, nothing amiss. What did Jesus say to him? Today. Today. Instantaneous. I didn't see it though. I didn't see the work in His heart. That's the best news though, isn't it? That's how fast God saves people. Instantaneously. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Some might say, well, that's not enough works. Let me ask you something. Where in Scripture does it teach you to quantify them? Where's it telling us five's better than four, but you've got to have ten and not nine? Give me a number, by the way. You won't find that chapter or verse either, folks. You know why? Because Jesus does the saving and Jesus does the keeping. And friend, if it's one work or a million, well, praise the living God. But friend, at the end of the day, you are saved. And that saving grace will produce naturally good works, even if you're hanging on a cross. 
See, it's not the amount that's significant of the works and showcasing saving faith. You're just as saved on the moment, think about this, of conversion as you'll be the day before you stand in front of God. That's the truth. You're as saved today as you'll ever be. You're as saved at conversion as you'll ever be saved. And when you stand before Almighty God, you're just as saved as the day He saved you. Because Jesus Christ has done the work. He is the one that says it is finished. I thought about my grandfather. He has a very similar story like this. My mom's dad was a hard man. A very hard man. Korean War veteran. He came back and he had a young daughter by that time. Uh, he and Mama had started a life and just, they were poor. They didn't have a lot going for them. And he made it a thousand times worse. Um, he went over a rough man and came back a rougher one. Alcohol, abuse, neglect. I mean, just a rough gambling. Just, I mean, wasted all their paychecks. It was awful. Very violent. He hated church, hated church people. Mamma would pray and pray and pray and invite him to church. It just seemed like things got worse and worse and worse. And thank God one day he went. I mean, out of nowhere, he just went. Went to the service that night. They gave an invitation. He goes forward. He said some words. They go home. And Mamma said, well, all right, well, our Harlan, well, I mean, what is it, you know? He said, I don't feel anything different. She said, why'd you go up there? He said, just to get people off my back. She said, but you said those things. Yeah, but I don't really mean it. See, friend, how close it would have been to somebody to walk up to him and be like, well, praise the Lord, brother. You're in. I thank God that nobody said that. I thank God that my grandmother looked him dead in the eye and said, well, you need to get things right then. A couple days go by. Nothing. Still praying. Back to church, comes back home, nothing. I remember Memo said, it's out there in the front yard. Just to talk again. Well, what? I mean, what? what's going on? I just, I don't, nothing. I don't get it. I don't, I don't understand how you do it. He said, I can't live that life. Thank God she had enough gospel in her to say, that's true. You can. You need to put your faith in Him. Right there in the front yard of their house. She led him to the Lord during the grass. I remember Mamaw telling me, you know, I thought it was true, but I was just being cautious. She said a couple of days went by. It was Wednesday. We always went to Wednesday night prayer meeting. She said he came home from work, came in, grabbed some supper, went and took a shower, and I thought, well, maybe not. She said, next thing I know, here he comes out in nice clothes. He looked at everybody and said, all right, let's go. She said, go where? And he said, well, church, come on. We're going, ain't we? She said, I knew immediately. That's the first time I ever heard him in my life actually looking forward to going to church. She said he got there and apologized to everybody. Just stood up and just began to apologize for all the things he'd said to people and things that he'd done. And she said, I just knew right there. Like, that's a work of faith. That was it. Friend, if he'd have died right there, he'd have been just as safe. He'd have been just as safe. Why? Because it's not the quantity of the works. It's has the blood of Christ been applied to your life for newness of life. Yes, I thank God that He went on to produce more fruit. Probably win more souls to Jesus than I ever have in my preaching time. I can hear stories of Him right now. I mean just cornering people with the Gospel. I mean almost like to the point of harassing them with Jesus. Just grabbing people by the collar. You need to be saved. I mean, just, you know, very uh, interesting evangelism tactic. I wonder what he think about sometimes my preaching. He passed away years ago. But I'll tell you what, everybody that came to the funeral, I can remember this. That's a saved man. How do you know that? Work of faith. Nobody saw his heart. You can't. You can't see that. But boy, they saw the life lift out among people that that man is two sides of the same coin. Saving faith and a work of faith in his life. Number three, faith without works is fatal though. Verse 20. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? 
Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac on the altar? You see, faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by works. And the Scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works, not by faith alone. You go, Ooh, look at that. Careful now. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the Spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is what? Dead. Friend, faith without works is fatal. It's literally dead. Think about this. True Christians have the life of Christ in them through the power and the work of the Holy Spirit. And unbelievers lack that faith and are still dead in trespasses and in sins. It's not faith plus works. It's faith that produces works. Don't put words in James' mouth that aren't there. It's easy to read that. That's not what he's saying. He's saying They are justified by faith, and we know that because you saw their faith. They literally lived out their faith. Again, he's not saying that works saved. He's simply saying real faith leads to real works that are in accordance with the Scriptures. Because listen to me. Now watch this. We just read Ephesians 2, 8, 9 a moment ago. Grace through faith, not of work. Did anybody know verse 10, though, right after that? For we are His workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Paul and James, same page, friend. Same page. Nobody's contradicting anybody. You know why I know that? Because the Holy Spirit's writing both of them, and the Spirit's not divided. Think about this. He gives you two examples here one is Abraham, one is Rahab. One's a Jew, one's a Gentile, one's a man, one's a woman. You know what the good news is? God saves a lot of different people. And nobody deserved it. Friend, before Abraham was called, you know who he was? A sinner. Lost and undone and headed right to hell where he belonged. Who was Rahab before God saved her? A sinner, lost and undone, headed to hell where she belonged. And God intervened. Think about Abraham for just a moment. He teaches that Abraham showed us his faith when he offered up Isaac on the mountaintop altar. Genesis 15 verse 6 says, But he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Think about this. 30 years before he walked up the mountain of Isaac. So we think that happened so fast. Well, this took place and then that and then that. No. No. Faith in God, salvation. And 30 years later, oh, by the way, Abraham still living. Still living. Now, folks, we could not have seen the faith of Abraham's heart in Genesis 15, could we? But you can't miss his faith when he's walking up that mountain. You can't miss it. Got the wood, got Isaac, got the staff, we're all headed up here. You can't miss that faith. But you didn't see it when it first happened. But he was just as saved when he counted it to him for righteousness as he is walking up that mountain. James is reminding all of us, don't you dare tell me that you trust God for salvation and it does not affect your life. And he said, I'll have none of that. There will be a conversion of people. You will be different. Amen. The Bible says that we are peculiar people. We are set apart. I mean, I hate to tell people, folks, Not everything in this world is Christian. And the Lord will bring us up in those things. He will sanctify us. Slowly but surely, He will do that. And we will learn, hey, not everything's okay. I don't need to be everywhere. I don't need to say everything. I don't need to do everything. There's some things i got to refrain from, but I'll tell you what, there's some things I need to be doing as well, though. I need to be soul winning. I need to go out and evangelize people. I need to tell them of Jesus Christ and His saving grace. Not of works, but of grace, amen. I need to, as James saying, if there's needy people, we ought to get out there and help some people, friend. You know why I know that? Jesus has helped us time and time and time again. We need to counsel with some folks. 
People need help. People need wisdom. People need advice. People need the Bible. Amen. We need to gather together as the saints. We need to worship the Lord. We need to pray together. We need to fellowship. We need to preach the book. These are all in accordance to the Word of God. But notice Rahab, though. A harlot. A Gentile. But becomes a follower of God because God counted it to her for righteousness. He said, when that happened? I don't know, but God does. I mean, I can't tell you the second that that happened in her life, but the Bible tells me it's counted to righteousness for her. How'd that happen? Same way it happened for Abraham. Same way it happened for you, by the way. Faith in God. How do we know that it happened? Because she takes these spies, hides them away, spares their life, and gives them a nice little exit plan when they went into the promised land. Those are God's people, by the way. He cares a lot about them. You know who else cares about God's people? God's people. Now, God's people care about God's people. That's why it kills me when I hear people say, I love Jesus, I just don't like the church. I have no idea what that means. How in the world could you love Jesus and hate His bride? That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. I mean, that's that's crazy talk, folks. That's like saying, I love Jeremiah, but I hate Morgan. Well, no, you don't love me then. Sorry. We have no relationship. Depart from me, worker of iniquity. You don't love my bride, you don't love me. Sorry, it doesn't work that way. You know what Rahab loves? God's people. You know why? Because she is God's people. How about that? Work of faith right there in her life. You know what's amazing about Rahab? She's in the lineage of Jesus Christ. You'll read that woman's name in the New Testament. How about that? What got her there? Faith alone. That's it. Just like anybody else. In other words, salvation can make a bad person good. How about that? It'll take a, a someone in all-out darkness and bring them into light, and praise God, it'll raise a dead person to spiritual life. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 still in my Bible. I'm sure it's in yours. Think about this. If any man be in Christ, Jew, Gentile, young, old, male, I don't care where you came from. Speak English, don't speak English. Southwest Virginia, Southwest somewhere else. I don't care. If any man be in Christ, he is a new Creature. Old things have passed away. Did they really, though? The Bible says He separates them as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered. So that sounds like a powerful God. Oh, He is. He most certainly is. Behold, all things are become new. This can be displayed in James' illustration. Think about this a body without the spirit. Think about this for just a moment. I got a friend, he works right across the hallway from me at the school system. His dad is a mortician. He embalms people. He's told me many times having to go out with his dad from time to time and late at night if something happened and they have to go collect the body and bring it back in, maybe an accident, something like that. And, and he said, I'm, I'm familiar with the process. You know, I mean, it's what we've done our whole life. It's, it's what dad does. And he said, I've been around some dead bodies. <laughs> he said, you know what the crazy part about it is? They're dead. And they don't get up and walk. It's over. They don't open their eyes. They can't say anything to them. They hear it. Their mind's not functioning anymore. The heart's not beating. No more breathing. It's over. It's done. There's nothing there. There's no life. <coughs> In order for a corpse to do good works, it has to have life. So when it does, it can move. And it can walk and think and talk and see and hear and all other sorts of important actions. But hear this, the body isn't walking and talking to receive life. It's walking and talking and moving because it has been given life. I can't sit here and tell you that I'm preaching because I'm trying to get saved. No, friend, I'm preaching because I am saved. <laughs> Because I certainly, when I was lost, was never thinking about this. I wasn't thinking about a work of Jesus. I was thinking about a work for me. You know what's crazy though? I was spiritually dead. Lifeless. Just a corpse. Similarly thinking about this, works don't make us alive spiritually. But when we receive new life, we can't help but to do good works. 
Friend, I remember when Judah was born, I didn't have to tell him, all right, start breathing. What's a natural thing he did? He just started breathing. Hey, all right, blink your eyes and look around and respond to things that I'm... I didn't have to tell him that. I definitely didn't have to tell Everly that, amen. Ooh, my goodness. She got a double portion of something that I wasn't aware of, but I didn't have to tell them that. See, it came natural to them. Why? They have life. They have life. I don't have to tell, all right, you need to eat. No, they'll let you know. I'm hungry. We didn't have to tell them that. We didn't have to tell you that when you were born. Why? Because you have life. When someone has new life, the most natural thing that they do for Jesus is live for Jesus. And it is a joy to do that. So I want to conclude by saying this. Thank God that this new life isn't something we've done or earned. My goodness, it has absolutely been accomplished by somebody a whole lot better than you and me. Jesus Christ is perfect and has given us new life. I love what Adrian Rogers said. He said there's two kinds of religion in the world. Grace, spelled D-O-N-E, and works, spelled D-O. Isn't that the truth? Grace and work, that's it. Only two types of faith out there. And praise God, Christianity has the corner market on grace, friend. You won't find it anywhere else. You can search Bahamas, you know what they're going to tell you? Do, do, do. Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism, you name it. It's all do. You figure out a way. Get there somehow. What's Jesus say? Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Friend, you're not going to find that anywhere else but in Jesus Christ. I think this morning that I'm, I'm so thankful I'm covered by D-O-N-E grace. <laughs> Amen. Not some made up version where I've got to do something. I'm covered by done grace. It is finished grace. Jeremiah, it, it's over. I've done the finished work, empty tomb at the right hand of God in the record book of life over here. It is settled in heaven, friends. It's over with. D-O-N-E done. And furthermore, I want to think about this this morning. Thank God for providing it over and over again. I thought about this a lot because I thought, man, has anybody put more works behind their words than Jesus? I mean, I've sat around that a lot this morning and I thought, Lord, do you really provide for us? And I can hear him just saying right now, Would you hand me that fish and bread? And I'll show you what I mean when I say provide. Lord, do you really care about us? I just hear him looking at Peter and saying, just throw that net one more time on the other side. Just trust me. Nobody puts works to words like Jesus does, friend. Are all things really possible with you? Mary Martha, watch out. Lazarus, come forth. Nobody puts works to words like Jesus. Lord, do you really love us? Thomas, come here and put your hand right here. And I want you to touch these now scarred hands. And you tell me if I love you or not. Friend, I would say the same thing to you this morning. Do you really believe that Jesus loves you? You should. He's done everything possible to win you to his Father, babe. He's died on Calvary. He's been buried. He's resurrected. Not a thing this world he might do to stop that. And by grace, he offers you this morning eternal life. You don't have to work for him. You don't have to labor and toil and this and that and the other. But you will labor when you get saved. And that is absolutely in accordance to the work of God. So this morning, can faith and works coincide? Yes, they ought to coincide. But you are not safe by work. But praise His holy name this morning. We get to work for Him when we are saved. I count it a privilege to preach. I count it a privilege to pray for people and to be a husband and a father and a co-worker and a friend and a church member. I thank God that I get to sing praises to Him. I'm not wasting my time on other things. I thank God that He's given me the ability to go out and help people and give and do and labor for the cause of Jesus Christ. I thank God for that. But friend, that would have never happened 
if I was not given righteousness through Jesus Christ through faith for me. So I don't sit here and pat myself on the back and say, hey, look what I've done. No, I'm telling you this morning, look to Jesus Christ and what He has done and bless His holy name. Amen. Let's go to Him in prayer.